The beginning is always today. These are the words of Mary Wollstonecraft, an 18th century British writer, philosopher, and advocate of women's rights. Not to be confused with Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, except that that would be her youngest daughter, the author of the cult classic Frankenstein. Mary Wollstonecraft was born on the 27th of April, 1759, in Spitalfields, London, the East End. She was the second of seven children born to Elizabeth Dixon and Edward John Wollstonecraft. While her family wasn't poor, at least in the beginning, her father wasted away most of his income on speculative projects. Consequently, the family became financially unstable and frequently forced to move. Not only did he squander any wealth he may have had, he was also apparently a violent man who would beat his wife in drunken rages. As a teenager, Wollstonecraft would lie outside the door of her mother's bedroom to protect her. Eventually, unhappy with her home life, she struck out on her own in 1778, accepting a job as a lady's companion to an elderly widow. Side note for any listeners aiming to expand their trivia knowledge for game night. A lady's companion was supposed to be a refined young woman who lived with another woman of rank or wealth providing company, conversation, and entertaining guests, while also earning a meager allowance. Basically, similar to a servant, but paid a little. The term was in use in the United Kingdom from at least the 18th century to the mid-20th century, but it's now, thankfully, archaic. Now you know, so good luck with game night. <laughs> Moving on, Wollstonecraft would later write about the drawbacks of such a position. In 1780, she briefly returned home to care for her dying mother, but perturbed by the actions of her father and saddened by her mother's death, soon after she again set out to earn her own livelihood. Rather than return to the cantankerous old widow's employ as a lady's companion, Wollstonecraft moved in with the Bloods, a poor family, the family of her best friend Fanny. She credited Fanny, who would one day become an English illustrator and educator, with opening her mind. She dreamed of having a female utopia with Fanny. They'd made up plans to rent rooms together and support each other emotionally and financially. This dissent remained a fantasy. Instead, in order to make a living, Fanny and Wollstonecraft, along with her sisters Everina and Eliza, set up a school together. In 1784, the women established a school in an area of London, the Newington Green. But the school only lasted a year. Fanny, less radical than Mary, soon married and moved to Lisbon, Portugal with her husband. Already plagued with poor health, when Fanny became pregnant, her health deteriorated. So Mary left the school to nurse her friend in Portugal, but sadly, both baby and Fanny died shortly after the birth. Devastated when her best friend died in 1785, Wollstonecraft took a position as a governess to the daughters of the wealthy Anglo-Irish Kingsborough family in Ireland. She loved teaching the children and was an inspiring instructor. One of the daughters, Margaret King, would later say she had freed her mind from all superstitions. While she enjoyed teaching, she eventually found she was not suited for the domestic labor of a governess either. Frustrated by the limited career options open to respectable yet poor women, in 1786, she decided to embark upon a career as an author. This was a radical choice then, since, at the time, few women could support themselves by writing. As she wrote to her sister Everina in 1787, she explained that she wished to become, quote, the first of a new genus. Fortunately, she'd had the good luck to meet a stand-up guy, the liberal publisher Joseph Johnson, in London. Johnson was a noted publisher of radical texts. Here she found a place to live and work and support herself. She learned French and German to become Johnson's translator and advisor. When he launched the Analytical Review in 1788, Mary became a regular contributor, writing reviews, mostly of novels. Johnson would go on to publish several of her works throughout the coming years. Wollstone's intellectual universe expanded during this time not only from the reading that she did for her reviews, but also from Johnson's circle of friends. At his famous dinners, she met radical influencers like Thomas Paine, Thomas Holcroft, William Blake, and William Woodsworth. Johnson himself became much more than a friend. 
She described him in her letters as a father and a brother. It was also around this time that she had her first love affair. She met Henry Fuseli, a Swiss painter, draftsman, and writer on art, who spent much of his life in Britain. Wollstonecraft pursued a relationship with him even though he was already married. She was, she wrote, enraptured by his genius. Quote, The grandeur of his soul, that quickness of comprehension, and lovely sympathy. End quote. As radical as she was, she proposed a platonic living arrangement with Fuseli and his wife. His wife was appalled, and he broke off their relationship. Fuseli later said, I hate clever women. They are only troublesome. By 1792, in Love Anew, Wollstonecraft left England to observe the French Revolution in Paris, where she lived with the American businessman, author, and diplomat Gilbert Imlay. Not a great guy. We'll find out why. In 1793, the British government had begun a crackdown on radicals, suspending civil liberties, imposing drastic censorship, and trying for treason anyone suspected of sympathy with the revolution, which led Wollstonecraft to fear she'd be imprisoned if she returned. Although Emily never married Wollstonecraft, he registered her as his wife at the American consulate to protect her once Britain and France went to war in February 1793. Then... In the spring of 1794, May 14th, Francis, or Fanny, Emley, Wollstonecraft's first child, was born in La Havre, named after Fanny Blood, her best friend. But Gilbert wasn't loyal or interested in the domestic life and left Wollstonecraft alone with an infant in the middle of the French Revolution. This was a scary time. While this isn't a lesson on the history of the French Revolution, after everything I read about it, so many people were being guillotined. Wollstonecraft called life under the Jacobins nightmarish. Known as advocates of egalitarian democracy, Jacobins engaged in terrorist activities during the French Revolution. For example, there were gigantic daytime parades requiring everyone to show themselves and cheer proudly, lest they be suspected of weak commitment to the Republic or arrested as enemies of the Republic during nighttime raids. In a March 1794 letter to her sister Everina, Wollstonecraft wrote, It is impossible for you to have any idea of the impression the sad scenes I have been a witness to have left on my mind. Death and misery, in every shape of terror, haunts this devoted country. I certainly am glad that I came to France, because I never could have had else a just opinion of the most extraordinary event that has ever been recorded. She would also write desperately to Emley, asking him to return to France at once, pleading that she still had faith in the revolution and didn't want to return to Britain. But his delays in writing to her and his long absences convinced her that he'd found another woman, which she'd come to find out he had. The winter of 1794 was the coldest winter in Europe in over a century. The River Seine froze that winter, which made it impossible for ships to bring food and coal to Paris, leading to widespread starvation and deaths in the city. Alone, Mary and her infant were in dire circumstances. And as a result, she and one-year-old Fanny left France in search of Emley, whom, as I'd mentioned, she'd discovered he'd taken up with another woman. Over her unsuccessful attempts to garner Emily's love, being abandoned and affected by the horrors of the revolution, she attempted suicide twice. The first time without details, apparently Emily actually rescued her. On another attempt, a stranger rescued her from drowning in the River Thames. Despite her depression due to the winter, revolution, and unrequited love, Wollstonecraft lavished affection and attention on her daughter. She continued to refer to herself as Mrs. Emley in order to bestow legitimacy upon her child and eventually returned to her literary life, becoming involved with Joseph Johnson's circle again. Although heartbroken originally over Emley, she'd soon fall in love again. She'd previously met the philosopher William Godwin in 1788, and when she was working for Johnson, the first time Godwin and Wollstonecraft met, they were actually disappointed in each other. Apparently, Godwin had come to hear Thomas Paine, 
but Wollstonecraft assailed him all night long, disagreeing with him on nearly every subject. But years later, he would read her writings and be impressed. He wrote, quote, If ever there was a book calculated to make a man in love with its author, this appears to me to be the book. She speaks of her sorrows in a way that fills us with melancholy and dissolves us in tenderness at the same time that she displays a genius which commands all our admiration." End quote. And in 1797, they fell in love. Despite their belief in the tyranny of marriage, when she became pregnant, they married. After their marriage that spring, Godwin and Wollstonecraft moved to Summerstown. Godwin rented an apartment 20 doors away as a study so that they could both retain their independence, often communicating by letter. By all accounts, theirs was a happy and stable, though brief, relationship. On August 30th, 1797, Wollstonecraft gave birth to her second daughter, Mary. Although the delivery seemed to go well initially, the placenta had broken during the birth and became infected. Childbed fever, postpartum infection, was a common and often fatal occurrence in the 18th century. After several days of agony, Wollstonecraft died of septicemia on September 10th. She was 38. Godwin was devastated. He wrote to his friend Thomas Holcraft, I firmly believe there does not exist her equal in the world. I know from experience we were formed to make each other happy. I have not the least expectation that I can now ever know happiness again. She was buried in the churchyard of St. Pancras Old Church, where her tombstone reads, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, born 27 April 1759, died 10 September 1797. Emily, remember Fanny's father, confirmed he'd had no interest in his child's welfare and left her to Godwin's care. So three-year-old Fanny was unofficially adopted by her stepfather and given the name of Godwin. Wollstonecraft's sisters begged Godwin to let them raise the two little girls, their nieces, Fanny and Mary, but he refused. He would later remarry, and so much more would happen, romantic and sad, fascinating and complicated. But this is about Mary Wollstonecraft's life and she left an indelible mark on her daughters through her writings. In January of 1798, a year after her death, Godwin published his Memoirs of the Author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. That's a lot of ofs. <laughs> Although Godwin felt that he was portraying his wife with love, compassion, and sincerity, Many readers were shocked that he would reveal her illegitimate children, love affairs, and suicide attempts. Because of his book, Wollstonecraft's reputation was regarded with disdain for nearly a century, overshadowing her own remarkable writings. Although many viewed her unfavorably, there was one writer of the generation after Wollstonecraft who apparently did not share these judgmental views, Jane Austen. While Austen never mentioned the formidable young woman by name, several of her novels contained positive insinuations to Wollstonecraft's work. Fast forwarding, in 1851, Wollstonecraft's remains were moved by her grandson Percy Florence Shelley to his family tomb in St. Peter's Church, Bournemouth. And in 2011, her image was projected onto the Palace of Westminster to raise support for a permanent statue of the author. With all of her strengths and intelligence, when she was younger, especially in her close friendships and early romantic relationships, she expressed a profound neediness of attention. She even wrote to a friend, I have formed romantic notions of friendship. I'm a little singular in my thoughts of love and friendship. I must have the first place or none. Perhaps this codependency was due to her tumultuous childhood. She was not perfect as no human being is. But as she experienced and learned more, her ideas and feelings matured. I think this statement marks her growth. She said, quote, love from its very nature must be transitory. To seek for a secret that would render it constant 
would be as wild a search as for the Philosopher's Stone, or the Grand Panacea, and the discovery would be equally useless, or rather pernicious to mankind. The most holy band of society is friendship." End quote. While her personal life may have overshadowed her writings, her personal life was also acquiescent of her thinking. She argued for the emotional, economic, and educational independence of women, something she herself had to live and grow through. She refused to be an object to a man and even had her first child out of wedlock. She took pride and succeeded in educating young women to be strong and independent thinkers. Even without the opportunity to raise her daughters, they would seem to cherish her ideas and writings from what she left behind. Communication scholars, which I am one, look at Wollstonecraft's early influence on rhetoric and critical theory. She believed it was the oppressive patriarchal rhetoric that degraded women. For example, she challenged the historical context of what is considered, air quotes, natural, at least according to the patriarchal definition, and how that shapes so much of women's roles and identities, perhaps even still today. Her most famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, was published in 1792. While reading it, I found it to be surprisingly humorous. For example, I laughed when I read her use of the funny idiom, to harp a little on an old string, regarding her incessant frustrations. She also used the term rake often, so I had to look it up. Noun, a desolate or immoral person, especially a man who indulges in vices or lacks sexual restraint. A side note, in some of her other writings, she even boldly asserted that women had strong sexual desires and that it was degrading and immoral to pretend otherwise. In Vindication, she clearly detested the prevailing notion that women are helpless adornments of a household. Instead, she stated that society breeds, quote, gentle domestic brutes, end quote through an educational system that deliberately trains women to be frivolous and incapable, women are confined to an existence in robbing them of their own identity. The solution, she suggests, is educational reform, giving women access to the same educational opportunities as men, rather than being oppressed and denied use of their own reason. She believed this reformation would result in women who would not only be exceptional wives and mothers, but also capable workers in many professions and benefit all of society. Wollstonecraft challenged the hierarchical social structure and believed that women, as humans, had the ability to reason too. Among her many books, the British historian Tom Furness called An Historical and Moral View of the French Revolution the most neglected of Wollstonecraft's works. It was first published in London in 1794 and again in 1989. While people today tend to be more interested in her feminist writings than in her account of the French Revolution, Furness called it her best work. She wasn't a trained historian, but she did her research. She scoured journals, letters, and documents to recount how ordinary people in France reacted to the revolution. She was trying to counteract the anti-revolutionary opinions in Britain, which depicted the revolution as simply the entire French nation's going mad. She, however, argued that the violence began from a set of social, economic, and political conditions that left no other way out of the crisis than the eruption of a revolution. Witty, wise, brave, and beautiful, even as early as the late 1700s, she challenged those at the top. While largely controversial, her writings didn't bring about any immediate reforms. But in future women's movements, some of her principles were resurrected. Women don't need to have power over men. Women need to have power over themselves. She gave a message of hope when she wrote these words, quote, Surely something resides in this heart that is not perishable, and life is more than a dream. End quote. And that's it. The life of this remarkable woman, Mary Wollstonecraft. A bold dash in her brief epitaph. So remember, 
the beginning is always today. I hope you have strength, perspective, and grace in each and every one of your beginnings as you learn and love. Beautiful Gray Sponge is brought to you with a gift economy mindset. I get to do, to be, to feel in this work and joy of creating a podcast. But it's not much of a podcast without listeners. So thank you for liking and sharing. And if it benefits you in such a way of an exchange, remember that Beautiful Gray Sponge is possible through the generous donations of listeners like you. And no gift is too small. Check out beautifulgraysponge.com to find out how you can make a monetary contribution. And especially, thank you for listening. <laughs>